Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And Mr. Old, that's an incredible thing. I, uh, everywhere I go, I know it's not popular. Uh, those of you that have been to the third and first district conventions, you've heard me talk about, you know, if you really want to change, make school board races partisan. Mm -hmm. And make people actually put money where their mouth is instead of pretending to be one thing and then acting another. Mm -hmm. So, those of you that do not know, my name is Marion Warren. I'm a former district court judge, uh, former director of the North Carolina Administrative Office of the Courts. It's, the, it's one of those titles that you have no <laughs> idea what that means. I understand. <laughs> but basically, I ran the court system for Chief Justice Mark Martin. And it was at that time that I got to know Tom Murray. Uh, to let you know how much I believe in Tom Murray, this is the first day I've been outside of the house since I've had open heart surgery. God bless you. 30, 30 days ago exactly today. Okay? Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. And the reason I'm telling you that is I could do a whole list of accolades about Tom Murray and why he should be our next Attorney General. There's three things I just want to share with you very quickly as my introduction from him, of him to you. Uh, Y'all have been incredible to me. I have spoken to you now, and I think it's the third time. I've been here four times. Uh, Y'all are awesome. Y'all are awesome. The last time we had a Republican Attorney General, Jim Holzhauser, appointed uh, a gentleman that was, it was in 1974. His term ended in 75, and that's when we got, um, oh man, he took in the, the uh, auditor when she wrecked her car during Christmas. Rufus. Rufus Edmonds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he, uh, let, he, he didn't run. He let Rufus walk into the seat. So think about that. That's almost 45 years of not having a Republican in the most important job that you've never heard of or you don't think about or you don't know what it does. And that's the Attorney General of North Carolina. Why is it important? It's a, being the Attorney General of North Carolina is important because he, he or she is supposed to be the top lawyer for the state defending the decisions of the North Carolina General Assembly and the North Carolina Judiciary in the courts of both the state and the federal government. They're supposed to be the top cop. They're supposed to be responsive. They're supposed to be leaders. Sadly, after 16 years, and there's no term limits, it's not like being the governor. So after 16, eight years of Mike Easley, who I personally know, 16 years of Roy Cooper, eight years or going on eight years of Josh Stein, mm -hmm. what's happened to this state as far as us going up to the uh, U.S. Supreme Court and getting something done? Nothing. Nothing. What we have is an attorney general that instead of standing up and doing the job he was elected to do, what he will actually do is recuse himself. He'll let someone in his office do the job that he's supposed to be doing. He'll build what he says is a Chinese wall, which is a legal term saying that we're not going to have any communication. He says he's building that Chinese wall while his, the people that work for him is doing what they're he's supposed to be doing, and then he goes and writes a brief and does what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. He doesn't do what the law says. He does what his partisan friends ask him to. He goes out there and stands on principle that is his principle. It's not the will of the people that elected the individuals that are making the laws. Tom Murray is a father, is a soldier. If you go out there and look at his car, he's got a global war of terrorism tag on his automobile. Go Army. Absolutely. He's a pharmacist. He's a lawyer. He's a believer. And he's an overachiever. And he will do everything that he says within his power, within the law, within the faith that you place in him to get the job done that he says he will do. He's never not succeeded. His dad's a, ba a Baptist minister. His mother's a successful businesswoman. He knows what it's like to come up from hard scratch in Arkansas and make it all the way up to the top of his profession. Tom Murray is not merely a candidate that wants a job. He's the candidate that we need for a job that's been sorely lacking for the last 45 years. 
I apologize. I cannot stay with you much longer. I'm going to step out the side door. I wish I could hear, but I've heard Tom. His first act as a legislator was to sign, create, and, and uh, then solicit support for something back then that he called voter ID. It's still being litigated, but it was his first act in the North Carolina General Assembly. When he mentioned less than, I don't know, when did you announce? About a month ago. So right when I went into the hospital, he, he announced as his candidacy that one of his first things he would do is not create some study, not create some task force, not create some commission, but he would put together a group of people to actually work on not asking for money and spending money, but finding a way in the existing framework of our laws and our resources to do something about the opioid epidemic. Josh Stein's been in, in the uh, AG's office for going on six years. Four days after Tom Murray announced that as a part of his uh, campaign announcement kickoff, the current AG decided to put together something that looked just like it. That's a leader, not a follower. I'm telling you I'm going to vote for him. I got up out of bed and got dressed to come and do this today. And if that means nothing else from a man's endorsement, there's no greater one I think I can give. My friend and my brother, Tom Murray. So I got asked to work for the court system by Mark Martin, thinking I was going to go help a Chief Justice of North Carolina Supreme Court. But I was blessed to be able to work with Marion Warren. That was, the, that was the real benefit of getting to work for the court system for four years, is actually getting to know and work with uh, Marion Warren, uh, who I consider one of my closest, closest friends. He's, we have sharpened each other's iron for the better part of 10 years. And so I appreciate the words. And I, um, uh, the best thing I can say about Judge Warren is that I've heard his voice get stronger over the past month because um, I don't like to hear when my friends are in the hospital, especially with a surgeon's knife going through their heart. That, that doesn't, that's not a happy thing for me. And so to see him upright <laughs> this side, this side of heaven <laughs> is a real and, and is, is a really good thing to see. So I haven't seen him, and it's been way too long. So my name is Tom Murray. I'm running for North Carolina Attorney General. Uh, as Judge Warren mentioned, um, I'm a state prosecutor. Uh, I've been doing I've been a, a prosecutor the past couple of years, and just north of Wake County. So the district that I, I prosecute crime in, if when you come on I-85 and you're driving from Richmond. And you come into you come into North Carolina, you get to Warren County, then Vance County, then Granville County, and then you've got Person and Franklin. That's five county district. I've served as an assistant district attorney in that district for the past couple of years. And my caseload, as you heard, I'm a pharmacist. I went to pharmacy school before I went to law school. My joke is I can write I can I can fill your prescription or write your will, right? <laughs> I, just don't, I just hope I don't have to do that on the same day, right? <laughs> And so, uh, but uh, so that I handle I handle, I handle felony drug crimes, and so that I eighty five corridor. I'm sure you can imagine we get we get we see a little bit of drugs coming between uh, New York and Atlanta, and so this fentanyl problem that you've heard about, it's a it's a direct correlation because of the reckless open border policies coming out of Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. The fentanyl is coming from China. It's coming in through our south border, and now it's in every community across our state, just like. Every state is a border state now. Well, every, every crime is a drug crime. If somebody breaks into somebody's house, chances are they're trying to steal something to support their drug habit. Counselor, have you heard about the car fentanyl problem? I just learned about that. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a car fentanyl is a derivative of fentanyl. So the way it's I, worse than, it's the way I describe, so car fentanyl, I'm doing this, I'm doing this because this is how my, my organic chemistry teacher taught me. So you got fentanyl, you got car fentanyl. We call them like dextrorotenary isomers. They're basically the same chemistry. It's just you do a little bit of extra chemistry and it gets a lot stronger. 
and so these synthetic drugs are streaming across our borders into our communities, destroying them one overdose at a time. I, I, I don't even have to tell you stories about what I've seen as a prosecutor because you've seen them firsthand. You've seen them firsthand. You read about it in the paper. And so that ta that that idea to take the assets across our state and to partner because criminals don't care about county lines. And you've got a great sheriff here, and having his ha taking his good ideas and assets and helping the counties around him. That's the idea. That's that's the plan. That's the plan on what, how, how we're going to get after this fentanyl problem. And so when our current attorney general announced that uh, that he was going to ask the general assembly to fund a fentanyl control unit, I was like, at least I've got his attention, right? He's at least reading my press releases. So I sent out a couple mean tweets after that, uh, <laughs> and I said, now that I've got your attention, let me let me add. And you're willing to do your job, finally. Let let me add to the list. Defend voter ID. I'm, I'm going to make one correction to what Judge Warren said about my biography. My first bill wasn't actually voter ID. My first legislation was actually to tell the federal government that they can't force North Carolinians to purchase health insurance. So when I got elected, we were running against we were running against uh, a big part of the big federal overreach of Obamacare was to force every American to purchase a product whether you wanted it or not. Now. I can't think of a, of a greater federal overreach than requiring you to purchase a product. So we, I filed legislation to stop that. It was the second bill we filed. It was passed within seven days, and Governor Perdue vetoed it. And in and, and the first two weeks of the new, brand new Republican majority, <coughs> so I was part of that. I was part of that wave. That, that from 11 to 14 is when I was in the state house. Now in 2013, I did file the first voter ID bill. The Obama administration sued the state of North Carolina over that law, and Eric Holder, his Department of Justice, subpoenaed my legislative email to prove, try to prove our intent on why we passed that. Well, my intent was clear. One, the cheapest, easiest way to prevent voter fraud is with in-person voter ID. That's the yeah. cheapest, easiest way. When we did, a, we did an analysis of the match between the voter file and the DMV file, we're talking 98% match. So I'll be glad to help that last 2% get a, get a photo ID. I don't know how you participate, I don't know how you participate in modern society without a photo ID. Sudafed. Just come to the pharmacy and try to buy something to help your head cold. You gotta have a photo ID to do that. Rent a car, get your cash a check. You know, all the things. Go to the doctor. All the thing. All the things you need a photo ID. It's not. It's 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 a good thing for society for everybody to have a photo ID. So that was that's a big piece of a big piece of legislation. So since I had since I had our attorney general's attention with my with my press release, I said get after photo get after voter ID. Also, stop felons from voting. There was a settlement that our current attorney general negotiated without general assembly involvement that added 56,000 felons who hadn't finished their probation to the voting rolls of the state of North Carolina in violation of North Carolina law. And it was a settlement, like I said, out of court. Does that sound right to y'all? The last thing I'll say is we've had a law on the books in North Carolina that protects life starting at 20 weeks for over 40 years. It's a 40-year-old law. And that's one of those laws that Judge Warren was talking about that our current attorney general is not defending. Right? It's pretty, pretty, it's pretty simple. It's been, on the, it's been on the books for 40 years and for ideological reasons not defending that law. That's not, the, that's not his choice. That's the General Assembly's choice is to, is to make that law is to make that law. And if they change the law, the Attorney General's job is to defend the law as, as passed by the General Assembly. Right? And so when the General Assembly chooses to protect life, protect your Second Amendment rights, or whatever, whatever the General Assembly passes, the job of the Attorney General is to defend those laws. And that's what I'm going to do as your Attorney General. So, but let's get back to where I started. He, you know, this reporter over here has got a Razorback on his shirt. And there, there's, a reason, there's a reason why he wore that. It's because I grew up in Arkansas. So Judge Warren mentioned that I, my dad was a Baptist preacher. My mom was a school teacher, and she also has a 
uh, uh, she does piano. She does piano lessons on the side. Uh, she's a music teacher, and so um, um, I'm, I'm a husband and father of three. My and if you want to know what kind of kids we're raising, my, both my teenage girls work at Chick Fil A. All right, all right. Uh -oh. And so they'll look you in the eye and they'll say, "My pleasure." <laughs> right. And so they're they're great. They're great kids. And then we got a little guy, a third grader. But they're a big part of my why. We've kind of got a theme in our house. It's Joshua twenty four fifteen. I feel comfortable saying this in the in a church. Joshua twenty four fifteen. Is anybody, anybody familiar with that verse? You can, you can choose who you're going to serve. And I think we see politicians That's serving their donors. Nice. They serve their donors. They serve the next political office. They you know they they're serving they're serving other things. But as for me and my house, you can choose who you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Right. That's that's a choice that we're making. It's a big part, big part of our family motivation, and so um, that's how we're raising our kids. Uh, so I grew up, uh, went to pharmacy school in Arkansas, went to went and moved. My wife's from Maryland. I met her in Virginia at the time. She gets a job in the Research Triangle Park, and we've lived here for 20 over 20 years, and just outside of Raleigh. And that's when I started law school at Campbell. While in law school, while in law school, I was 28 years old. I ran for my town council. And Morrisville, and it's about the town. At the time, it was the fastest growing town in, in Wake County. It's kind of a small town, kind of one of those boom towns, right? My first vote, my first vote on the as a 28 year old, first term, first meeting on the town council was whether to give a million dollars of tax taxpayer dollars to a multi billion dollar corporation to get them to move to our town. And I, I was the only person that voted no on that. It was six to one, and I was the one. So, why do I tell you that story? Being a conservative is kind of where I am. <laughs> See, I can't help it. I can't help it. That's, my, that's where I started. My first vote as a council member, I think we can spend a million dollars of taxpayer dollars better than that. Right? Wouldn't that be considering pandering? It, it's it's considered a lot of things. I can, the, the funniest story about that, though, and I can't remember the reporter's name. Somebody from the News and Observer called me. He's like, "Why?" And he was he was giving it to me. Like, "Why did you Why did you vote for that?" And then at the end of it, I gave him all my reasons. And at the end of it, he's like, "You know, I agree with you." <laughs> That's when I was like, "Hey, we're we're doing the right thing." When the report, when I finally when I got a reporter to agree with me, hey, we're in good shape. We're in good shape. But I tell you that. As a principle, like it, that, that idea of being a conservative principle. Same thing about my first bill. The federal government can't tell you what to buy. That's a fundamental core conservative principle, right? And so I think I think those principles are important. You need to know that about me. Um, so I served on the town council uh, and got reelected. I got elected in 05, got reelected in 09, and I got asked by several legislators in Wake County to run for the state legislature. So I want to take you back. If you can remember, in that 0809 time frame, the Democrats were had the governor's office and both chambers in the General Assembly. The year I ran, 2010, the Democrats and Governor Purdue furloughed teachers. We people have forgotten this. They furloughed teachers, they raised income tax, and they increased your sales tax by a penny. So they increased two taxes, they furloughed teachers, and unemployment was double digits. It was over 10%. Yeah, I remember the taxes because I do my own taxes. And that was a, that, so, and so from my perspective, after dealing with small business pharmacy issues and being on the town council, you raise sales tax, you raise income tax, you furlough teachers, it's going to have an economic impact, and as a result, <coughs> unemployment spiked to over 10%. That's a linear thing for me. That doesn't, that's, that is a, you take money out of the economy through taxes, and it's going to have a negative economic impact, and that's what we saw. So we fixed all that. We let those taxes sunset, okay? Gave a billion dollars back to the taxpayers. And then as a result, we had to make up a lot of budget cuts. I had to do a lot of tough budgeting that first couple cycles. Um, but I'll tell you one thing that I brought to the table, that year there was a major blockbuster drug that, was, that went generic, 
and nobody was catching. Like, even even uh, Purdue's Health and Human Services, like, do you know this drug's going generic? It's probably going to save Medicaid a little bit of money. Turns out it was over a million dollars of savings. So we we forecasted that. That wasn't a cut. That was a saving. So we did some really smart things that first time, but it was tough. That was very very difficult. My second term, I got to chair the Commerce Committee. And so I'm a second term legislature uh, chairing the Commerce Committee. That's, what I, that's a, a lot of what I focused on. And so uh, after I left the General Assembly, I got to work for our court system. And, and while I was in the court system, this is when I deployed my first time. I, I've only deployed once, but while I was serving as, as Judge Warren's chief of staff, I deployed to the Middle East. And let me tell you, uh, how many veterans do we have in there? And so, um, when, when, you, when you're talking to these veterans that have experienced what I call America's away colors, right? You know, you get, to, you get the home colors, but sometimes you got to play away. If you've ever played, the, on the, on the, you know, played as the away team, whether it's Afghanistan, Iraq, Kuwait, Jordan, I visited all those places. It makes the home colors a lot brighter. Does that make sense? So this is what I want to do. Uh, now I'm going to pause right here. One of the things I like to do is pass out these American flags. This is for your car. So everybody here tonight is going to get a decal from me uh, as a token of my appreciation for our country. And so I'm going to pass these out right now. And please feel free to pass these out. And I'll tell you, the more people that, the more people see the American flag, the the more the more they will they will understand why we do what we do. So why are you taking time on a Tuesday night to listen to a candidate? It's because of this, what this flag represents. It's because of what this flag represents. And I'll tell you, the red, white, and blue is a whole lot more red, white, and blue once you've been in a place that doesn't share the values of America, but they want America to come in and help them be free. They want freedom. They want liberty. They want the opportunity to succeed. That's why we go to help folks, right? And, and so, um, um, having been on the other side and been deployed, I can tell you um, I have no problem passing out American flags to, for you to put on your car and display the patriotism that we all share. Yeah, you don't have to go no further than Canada to, to lack freedom. Canada doesn't <laughs> have as much freedom as it. And they're just as free as any, not as free as us, but... The, the American the experiment is the envy of the world. That's, that's, that's absolutely clear to me. This is the land of opportunity, and we need to cherish those freedoms and fight for them. And that's a big part of why, a big part of why I'm running. Because it means something. <coughs> that American flag, that, that symbol of freedom means something to me. I think we need to salute it. I think we need to honor it. And I think we need to defend the, the ideals that, cre that are the foundation of our, of our country. So, I deployed while I was at the court system, and then I came back and stayed on orders for another year and a half doing legal assistance for soldiers. And so I'm sitting with the soldiers that are about to deploy. I'm helping them write their wills, right? I'm helping them prepare to serve. And so my job for about a year and a half was to help. We mobilized in the NORCON National Guard about 3,000 soldiers to go to the Middle East as a heavy brigade combat team. And I, and I was a big part of the legal assistance uh, program that the North Carolina National Guard has to help soldiers be ready for the fight. And so I was helping a lot of families deal with issues while the soldiers deployed, they would call us and we'll help them navigate. So I did that for a year and a half, and then I joined the district attorney's office in 2020 where I focus on felony drug crime. So I'm gonna tell you about my last jury trial. Um, Two weeks before Christmas, I had a jury trial, um, and it involved heroin and fentanyl, okay? And so um, the date of offense was Christmas Eve, 2020. Um, it, the, there was a, it, was, it was actually started on the 23rd and bled into the 24th. So we're talking about the change of time. So it's like midnight, right in the middle of the night, right? And so we... Um, uh, the the there was a having at a gas station there in Franklin County there was a there was a gas station attendant that kind of saw this car sitting at one of the pumps a little too long and so uh, the passenger got out came in asked her you're open and came back out and they and there like I said they're sitting at that pump a little too long and finally she's like she came out and she started looking and she says the driver with the car running passed out okay 
So in North Carolina, if the vehicle is in operation and the driver is obviously impaired, yep. what do we call that? That's, a, that's driving while impaired, right? And so that's uh, the and so the driver is charged with driving while impaired. Um, but he's over, and the passenger is freaking out because he's overdosing. And they had already administered Narcan. And so bo bottom line is this gas station attendant who, was a mil who had experience as a military police person, she had a military, had a military police background, kind of helped save his life, got his shirt off of him, kind of revived him, that kind of thing. And then next thing you know, and so law enforcement gets involved because, uh, because of the overdose situation, calls the troopers, calls the deputies, and they end up finding, they end up finding about 50 dosage units of heroin and fentanyl in the car, a wad of cash in his pocket, and needles all over the car. The passenger is also impaired. When upon questioning at lo by local law enforcement, on the scene, what do you do for a living? I don't really have a job. So, you know, detective work says 50, 50 dosage units of heroin, cash, a lot of cash in your pocket, no job. Sounds like we've got possession with intent to sell and distribute. And so we did a jury trial, and that's what he got convicted of. And he's going to, and you could ask him about it, but it'll take him about three or four years to answer your questions because that's what the judge sentenced him to. I tell you that story is that it's not. The drug problem in, in North Carolina isn't just about a large amounts. Of, it, it's, it trickles down to the granular issues of driving while impaired, making our communities less safe. And I, I don't think you would be surprised if I told you that that particular defendant, that would have been his third DWI. Um, and, and we since found out after the trial that he picked up a fourth DWI. So this is, this is a public safety issue. This, this, uh, this, this drug problem is a public safety issue, and that's why I'm making it such a, a focus. Um, because I don't, I think we need somebody who has seen the problem in every in a courthouse with real cases, with real victims, with real problems, and and trying to get after this in a way that keeps our communities safe. Because that's the number one job of the attorney general is to keep our community safe. And we see, I've seen, when I, in my conversations with, uh, with district attorneys and sheriffs across our state, um, what, what I see, what I see is when you've got good law enforcement work and good prosecutorial work and you get, you a, you got a, you get a conviction after a jury trial and then that jury trial gets appealed, where does it go? Where does that go? Who defends that appeal? It's the Department of Justice. So the, the process of assigning attorneys to represent the state of North Carolina on, on, a, on criminal conviction appeals is a big problem right now. And based on the workload and the assignments, <coughs> I have heard through some friends across the state how an, attorneys with expertise in environmental law issues are being assigned criminal appeals and and so that's a major law that's a major problem when you're managing a law firm so the Department of Justice it, it's if you depend on how you count lawyers at different law firms the Department of Justice is either the largest law firm in the state of North Carolina or the second largest law firm in the state of North Carolina okay so I've, uh, I told you I was Judge Warren's chief of staff at the administrative office of the courts. We had 5,800 employees. Our budget was over half a billion dollars, 500 million, a little, uh, right at 500 million dollars. We managed that budget. We managed that budget. We managed those people. Oh, and I had 500 elected officials in my branch. So every district court judge, every superior court judge, every clerk of court, there's 100 of them, every, every district attorney, every magistrate and all their staff. <clears throat> Those are the people that, that we worked with every day. For four and I'm making a case on why I'm running for attorney general. I think I've got the managerial experience to run the largest law firm in the state of North Carolina. I think I've got the prosecutorial experience to keep our community safe. I think it's important to have a veteran who understands what our families go through when they mobilize. I've helped those families with their legal issues.
right? I've sat down with families who are trying to figure out what are we going to do while dad's gone, but we got this issue. Well, don't call dad. Call the law. Call me. Call, call me, and I'll, I'll help you figure this out. And then if we need to pull in that soldier, we can get through the chain of command. So I, I understand those issues, right? And then most importantly, I think, you gotta, you got to have somebody with private sector business experience. So let me, let me end with this. The reason I went to pharmacy school, this is a uh, th I can't I can't understand that. I grew up in a small town. So he's got a razor back on his shirt. Right. The town I grew up in is about three thousand people. My aunt, we worked at the front counter of the drugstore, and the first adults that I wasn't kin to, that knew my name, were those two pharmacists in my hometown. Wow. Right? Like I, I remember going to that drugstore. My mom would take me and see my aunt. And then the two guys in the back that, run the, that ran that business, you're like, hey, Tom, how you doing? How was school today? Right? Like, that's the kind of impression. And that, that motivated me to go to pharmacy school, right? Fast forward, it, when I was my last year of pharmacy school, I got to work in that pharmacy. And you know one of their, one of their patrons was my, my mom's mom, my grandma. And I got, to, I got to eat lunch with my grandma every day for a, two months working at my hometown pharmacy. So that, I, that's, that the impact that small businesses have isn't just about you know, putting money into business owners' pockets. It's about that community investment. You need somebody that appreciates that small business. The only reason I went to pharmacy school is because two dudes owned a pharmacy and knew my name. Right? <laughs> and, and, and that's it. I mean, that's it. And they took care of us. I was I advertised for him every t on the T-ball team, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about. Like that, that that's real. That's real. Now, compare that to, you know, I didn't go to Harvard Law School. I went to Campbell. You know, I went to Campbell Law School, right? This there's a there's a fabric that I understand coming from where I grew up, and that's a big part. I think we need that kind of understanding that grassroots, and this is why I'm in a group like this. There's some folks that say, that I'm not going to a meeting and only 20, 30 people in it. It's just not worth my time. You're going to drive, you're going to drive three hours one way to talk to 25 people? I know y'all's hearts. I know, I, I know why you're here. That's why I'm standing in front of you. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish with a story. Last, I, I'm, a story I'm a natural storyteller, so forgive me. <laughs> So I get asked to run in 2010, and I had a primary. So they, I was like, you're asking me to run, but you didn't clear the field. So I appreciate that. I, I would, you know, like, right? Right? You're asking me to run, but then we're like, well, good luck. And so if, I've been through a Republican primary. Now, if it was up to me, I'd avoid a Republican primary for this attorney general's office. I just don't think it's going to happen. So we're going to probably get to experience a Republican primary. So in 2010, I'm running a Republican primary. About half my district is Raleigh, and half my district is Cary, Morrisville, a little bit of Apex. So this is the this is the map. Terry Gore knocked on doors for me in the Raleigh part of my day. I said he was my Raleigh campaign manager, and I had another gal who was my Cary campaign. So let me tell you, when I announced that I was running for attorney general, one of the first people, like that, like a lightning bolt, I'm talking minutes. It goes out, social media, press release, email, Terry Gore, let me know what I can do to help. Now, in the early stages of a campaign, that kind of it, I didn't, I, truthfully, I, I knew you were still alive, <laughs> right? That's the rumor. <laughs> but I wasn't real sure where Terry got off to. I, I knew he was kind of in this, and the next thing I know, I get an invitation to speak before you folks because of his relationship with Christina. Now, serendipity, like, do you understand the, the, the encouragement that that kind of stuff brings to a a brand, a candidate in the early stages, starting a, a statewide campaign when 100 counties is as big as the state of North Carolina is like starting a small business from the script, from the ground up, and to have somebody reach out to me instantly and say, "I got your back in this part of the country, part of the state. You need to come out and speak to these folks." 
that's the kind of encouragement that I've been I've been experiencing. I've got a story like that in a bunch of counties, in a bunch of counties. Glad to see you running. We met when I was involved as a volunteer in Wake County in the Republic Party five or six years ago, but I live in Rowan County now. Can I speak for you at the Rowan County GOP convention? You know what I said? Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> now I don't have to go to Rowan County that weekend. I can go somewhere else. I've, I've been experiencing that all month. All right? I can't t I'm getting chills just telling you about this because it's. I'm fired up, folks. I'm fired up. And I, I'm really, really excited about this campaign. I'm really excited about um, uh, being here with you guys and coming back often. And I can tell you we're going to get after it. And um, last thing I'll tell you, you know, my wife and I, we've, we made a decision. So we had a family caucus. That's what my wife calls it. We, well, we, need to, we need to have a family caucus. If you're going to be running, we need to have a family caucus. So we on January 1st. So I, I knew uh, it, was, it was getting real. Like it was on January 1st, it was getting real in our house. We had the time. We spent a lot of time together at Christmas. It's like we're going to have to talk about that. So me, my teenage daughters, my wife, we sat down and talked about it. And we made it, and we're, we, we had a good, a good family conversation about this. And after the end of the conversation, my, my 16 year old, my 16 year old says, Well, I can't think of a reason not to do this. <laughs> right? And she kind of just cut to the chase, and that was the end of the meeting. Right? That was the end of the meeting. I can't think of a reason not to. We've asked all the questions, and I think we figured it out. So I started a leave of absence in my job three days later. And I'm doing this full time because I think that's what it's going to take. And we're getting after it. We've already been to 16 counties in less than 30 days. I'm almost to 20% of the state in less than 30 days. And I, and I, large, small, I've been to county conventions. I was in Lenore County last night in Kinston. Great fried chicken at King's. If you haven't been, <laughs> if you haven't been to King's Barbecue in Kinston, their fried chicken's pretty good. You know, it's pretty good. So we had a great meeting in Kinston last night. This weekend, I was in, I was in uh, uh, Davidson County, Guilford County, and then I went to a military ball in Forsyth County. We're getting after it. We're getting right. after it, folks. And so I appreciate your time. I think we got. I think we definitely can take some questions. Um, and and uh, that'll be. That's my. That's the extent of my remarks. But I kind of wanted to get you know who I was. That's really at the end of the day, the who and the what, the who, the who I am. Where did I come from? Where? What's the fabric of of what made me who I am? Right. And then and then the what I've done to earn your support and build the kind of. Re I didn't do any of the things that I just described because I thought one day I'd be running for Attorney General of the State of North Carolina. But if you're going to do a bunch of things to prepare you to be a successful candidate and actually do the job, I think that's probably what it will look like. I think that's probably what it will look like. So that's a big part of why I'm running and I appreciate y'all's attention. So be glad to answer any questions.